This episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream. What's Curiosity Stream? It's a subscription streaming service that offers thousands, thousands of documentaries and non-fiction titles for just $2.99 a month American dollars. Get a free 30-day trial, zero American dollars, by clicking on the link in the description below. More about them in a bit. You may remember in the torrent of news last year about an event in the port of Beirut, Lebanon. Yeah, among all the COVID stuff, I do remember there was an absolutely massive explosion because those videos were incredible. I mean, in a bad way, people died. In August of 2020, a warehouse storing 2,750 tonnes of ammonium nitrate caught fire, causing an explosion strong enough to register on seismometers, and it was heard as far away as Cyprus, more than 150 miles away. The details of the accident are still being investigated. But what we do know is that the explosion was equivalent to about 1.1 kilotons of TNT and it caused 207 deaths and 7,500 injuries. It was undoubtedly one of the worst man-made disasters in recent history. But what if I told you that the Beirut blast, despite the damage it inflicted, wasn't even the worst accident of its kind? Indeed, that there was a disaster like the Beirut explosion, but whose damage and death toll were orders of magnitude worse. And if you haven't seen videos of that exp I'm not sure if we're showing them now, because copyright is always a pain in the ass. But if you haven't seen it, and we're not showing it right now, go watch that Beirut explosion before you watch this video so you have an order, uh, an idea, of how big this thing is going to be. Well, there is such an explosion, and we have the breakdown of that accident for you here today, because this is the story of the Halifax explosion. The year 1917, and World War I was in the middle of its third year. Though the spotlight of the Great War tends to be stolen by the trench warfare of the Western Front, it was the situation on the high seas that proved just as important to the outcome. During the war, Britain and France bought huge amounts of supplies from the United States, from weapons to foodstuffs and beyond. And these were, of course, shipped across the Atlantic to the Allied countries. These readily available imports were not an option to the Central Powers, namely the German Empire. At the start of the war, the United Kingdom had its Royal Navy impose a total blockade of German shipping, one that was, even at the time, considered exceptional in its severity. Even food was considered contraband of war. Although Germany was able to produce sufficient amounts of food in peacetime, the demands of war resulted in many farmers being drafted, along with their draft animals and fertilizer being requisitioned for the war effort. What this meant was that the Western Allies had basically all the food they could eat, while Germany was forced to ration. The Germans were not blind to their dire situation on the ocean, which wasn't made easier by the fact that it was basically a free-for-all in terms of international law. We're going to more specifics, but honestly, the back and forth between Britain and Germany over the rules on submarine warfare and arming neutral merchant ships is a video entirely on its own. I'm not sure if we could cover it on this channel, but if you didn't know, I've got like 10 channels. I'll probably cover it at some point, somewhere. But for now, all you need to know is that both countries complained that the other was violating international law and, well, they were both totally right. There were not really any good guys in World War I, everyone was just kind of being a dick to each other. This is the background for our scene, which now turns to the Canadian port town of Halifax, Nova Scotia, an important pit stop in the transatlantic convoy system. Halifax at this time had struggled to make a name for itself, but prior to the outbreak of war, the Canadian government had made a huge effort to develop the town as a harbour city. As Canada was still a part of the British Empire at this time, the war resulted in British authorities adopting Halifax as their base in North America, and the town became a launch pad for supplies being shipped to the front lines. Many ships would load up on supplies from ports in in the eastern US and then stop in Halifax to depart under the protection of British warships. In addition to that, all neutral ships bound for North American ports had to report to Halifax for inspection to ensure that they were complying with the British blockade. Finally, to get the point across, a heavy military garrison was installed in the city, including anti-submarine nets in the harbour, which were raised at night to prevent any attacks. All of this sudden attention Halifax was getting resulted in something of a boom. From the start of the war to 1917, a whopping 60,000 people moved to the city, and the weight of goods shipped through the harbor increased nine times over what it was pre-war. And it was on the morning of December the 6th, 1917, that a very consequential cargo would enter the harbor.
All right, so there are two primary actors in this story. The first is the SMS Imo, a Norwegian vessel intended to carry relief supplies to Belgium at the time still under German occupation. The Imo had sailed from the Netherlands and arrived in Halifax on the 3rd of December for inspection and refueling, intending to continue to New York afterwards. The captain, Hakon Fromm, had been given clearance to leave Halifax on December the 5th, but the call for his ship had been delayed. By the time refueling was done, the anti-submarine nets had been raised in the harbor, forcing him to wait until morning so he could depart for New York. It was while Captain Fromm was sitting in port that our second character literally sails into the scene. The SS Mont Blanc was a French cargo ship which arrived at Halifax Harbor from New York on December the 5th, under the command of Aim Limadet. In the exact opposite problem of the Emo, the Mont Blanc arrived at Halifax Harbor too late before the submarine nets were raised, forcing it to wait outside the port until morning when the nets would be lowered. Its cargo was a load full of TNT, picric acid, gun cotton, and benzoyl fuel. Highly flammable, highly explosive. Normally ships carrying dangerous cargo like this would not be allowed into the harbor at all, but because of the war and German submarines, this rule was just not being enforced. When morning came, the Emo was given clearance to leave around 7.30 a.m. Ships were restricted to five knots within the harbor, but the Emo was steaming well above that in order to make up for the delay. As it moved towards the ocean, the Emo met not one, but two ships going the wrong way. That is, ships were expected to keep right, and these ships were keeping left. This forced the Emo to make its way onto the eastern end of the harbor into oncoming ship traffic. Meanwhile, at the mouth of the harbor, the Mont Blanc made its move to enter as the submarine nets were lowered. The captain and the harbor pilot followed the directions, keeping to the right-hand side of the channel. Then the pilot noticed a ship on a dangerous course with them. It was, of course, the Emo. The Mont Blanc attempted to signal the Emo that they had the right of way, but the Emo refused to yield its position. In response, Captain Lemedet ordered the Mont Blanc engines to be cut and steered the ship to his right towards the shore. Again, an attempt was made to signal the Emo in the hope that it would follow suit and steer away from the shore, but again the Emo refused to yield. In the moments that followed, the Emo cut its engines as well, but the momentum of its earlier speeding carried it forward closer and closer to the Mont Blanc, whose crew couldn't beach the ship for fear of setting off the explosives, which, as we will find out, will be a big disaster. In one last attempt to avoid a collision, the harbor pilot on the Mont Blanc ordered the ship to steer hard to the left, crossing the Emo's bow and bringing the ships parallel with each other. For a brief moment, this appeared to work until the Emo sent out a signal that it was reversing its engines. The ship's propellers suddenly spun in the opposite direction, and the whole of the ship was briefly directed rightwards, right into the hull of the Mont Blanc. Now, I promise you that some serious shit is about to go down, but before we get into that, let me tell you about today's wonderful sponsor, Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream is a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of documentaries and non fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, and they even have their own exclusive originals that you can't see anywhere else. Curiosity Stream is available on many platforms and web apps Roku, Android, Xbox One, Smart TVs, iOS, Chromecast, Amazon Fire, Amazon Kindle, and Apple TV. That's a lot of platforms. I mean, look, if you've got a screen that was made in the past few years, a smart screen of some kind, you're probably going to be able to watch Curiosity Stream, which is nice. Right now, they're a very popular documentary series called The Top Science Stories of 2020. Obviously, it features a bunch about COVID-19, but it also dives into other stuff like CRISPR, Mars Rover, fossilized DNA, and a lot of other exciting stories that you might have missed because the news was full of COVID stuff. If you're enjoying this video today about the Halifax explosion, why not check out another video about a doomed ship? Curiosity Stream has a great one-hour documentary called Titanic's Tragic Twin that profiles how the Britannic, a near-carbon copy of the Titanic, was re-engineered and reinforced after a certain iceberg rendezvous in the year 1912. Yet despite all of that, it met an incredibly similar fate. It's a cool story, and it's one of thousands available on Curiosity Stream. Go to curiositystream.com forward slash side projects for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and non-fiction series, it's just $2.99 a month. That's a steal. Better yet, $19.99 for the whole year. What? I remember when DVDs used to cost $19.99 and you got one that you'd never watch again. Now you can get thousands. It's amazing. And for you guys, the Side Projects fans, you can get Curiosity Stream for 30 days to try for free. Just use the code Side Projects at checkout and let's get back to those ships that are about to have a little kerfuffle. Montanus, 
The collision occurred at 8.45 a.m. and caused superficial damage to the Mont Blanc's hull. Yet the force from the impact was enough to topple and rupture several barrels of benzoyl fuel on the deck, which spilled over and flowed into the hold where the explosives were kept. Then, as the Emo's propellers reversed the ship, the scraping of the two ship's hulls caused sparks, which then ignited the spilled benzoyl, causing a fire in the waterline that then spread up the side of the Mont Blanc. Captain Lemedits instantly knew what was going to happen and frantically ordered his crew to abandon ship. As the crew entered their lifeboats and began rowing away from what was now a ticking bomb, they noticed that nearby ships had stopped to spectate the fire. They tried to shout to them that the Mont Blanc was going to explode, and unfortunately, many did not hear them over the confusion. In addition to this, many Halifax citizens began to gather on the streets and by their windows to watch the burning ship in the harbor. One ship, the tugboat Stella Maris, responded to the fire. Interestingly, this boat it was one of two ships that the emo had to dodge only minutes earlier. Attempts were made to fight the fire, but the boat was not remotely equipped to handle this sort of crisis, and the ship backed off. The captain of the Stella Maris was in the process of working with other nearby ships to tow the Mont Blanc away from the pier when the fire finally reached the ship's cargo of high explosives. This would be the culmination of this chain of catastrophes. Try to keep your bearings and remember that video in Beirut because the numbers we're about to throw at you are simply staggering. The explosion occurred at exactly 4 minutes and 35 seconds past 9 in the morning, almost 20 minutes after the initial collision. This exact time was determined using seismic records, and just well think about that fact for a second. The Mont Blanc's entire cargo of high explosives detonated all at once, the explosion being the equivalent of 2.9 kilotons of TNT. Now, to put that in perspective, the little boy nuclear bomb dropped on Hiroshima was the equivalent of around 15 kilotons of TNT. A blast wave from the explosion radiated outwards at more than 1,000 meters or 3,300 feet per second. At the center of the explosion, temperatures reached upwards of 5,000 degrees Celsius, that's 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit for Americans watching. A cloud of white smoke rose to a height of at least 3,600 meters, that's nearly 12,000 feet or two miles into the sky. Such was the force of this explosion that the water in the harbor was completely displaced, exposing the seabed. Water then rushed back in to fill the gap, causing a tsunami that rose as high as 18 meters above the high water mark of the harbor. This tsunami proceeded to carry multiple ships onto the nearby shore, including the Emo and the Stella Maris. Mont Blanc was completely obliterated. The explosion blew the ship into thousands of pieces, sending white hot shards of metal raining down on both Halifax and the nearby town of Dartmouth. The forward 90mm gun of the Mont Blanc was blown skyward and landed 5.6 kilometers, that's three and a half miles north of the explosion site. A part of the ship's anchor, weighing half a ton, landed 3.2 kilometers away, that's two miles. Almost everything within a 2.6 kilometer radius was either completely destroyed or badly damaged, with an area of over 400 acres being almost entirely scarred by the blast. Stoves and lamps were knocked over, starting fires throughout the city that would continue to burn for days afterwards. Factories were turned into heaps of rubble, and nearby dockyards were hit particularly hard, as were the train depots, where over 500 railway cars were reported damaged. In total, over 12,000 buildings were damaged or destroyed by the blast. Most of these buildings are people inside at the time. Many were standing by their windows watching the fire when the explosion happened, shattering the windows and blinding them with flying glass. As many as 5,900 eye injuries were reported in the aftermath, with 41 people suffering permanent loss of their sight. Workers in the factories were crushed by collapsing buildings. Cadets and instructors at the nearby Naval College were badly maimed. Sailors on ships near the Mont Blanc were hit hard. The Stella Maris lost 21 of her 26-man crew, with Captain perishing in the blast, but his son, the first mate, surviving. The crew of the Mont Blanc itself only lost one man. One survivor, the firefighter Billy Wells, had his clothes torn from his body and he was thrown away from his fire engine by the force of the explosion. He described the scene that he witnessed as such. The sight was awful, with people hanging out of their windows dead, some with their heads missing and some thrown onto the overhead telegraph wires. All in all, the Halifax explosion would kill 1,600 people instantly and injure over 9,000. 300 of those injured would later die. It was, without question, the worst man-made disaster in Canadian history.
Rescue efforts began almost immediately, with the neighbors and co-workers making attempts to dig people out of collapsed buildings. Not long after, the surviving emergency services got involved, and after that, anyone with a working car or truck was pitching in to help. The hospitals were quickly overwhelmed by the sheer number of wounded, with the Camp Hill Military Hospital admitting around 1,400 people in a single day. Extra manpower was brought in from across Nova Scotia as efforts continued, including firefighters as far away as Amherst, 200 kilometers or 120 miles away. Several ships near Halifax changed course to investigate and assist in rescue operations. One ship, the USS Tacoma, actually went to battle stations because they assumed that they were being fired upon. Indeed, some survivors initially believed that the explosion was the result of a bomb dropped by a German plane, although that rumor quickly dissipated. There simply weren't bombs that strong available. As if the initial disaster wasn't enough, a blizzard struck the area the very next day, dropping 16 inches of snow on the ground, stalling trains with supplies and knocking down the telegraph wires. Searches for survivors had to be called off. The one bright spot of the storm was that the snow helped put out fires which were, at the time, still ravaging the city. The monetary cost of the disaster this is only an estimate, but it stands at around 35 million Canadian dollars, which is about 519 million Canadian dollars today. The legacy of the Halifax explosion is one of breathtaking loss of life and damage. For a long time, the blast at Halifax was the singular explosive event that was used to compare other similar disasters to, including the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And while there is not so much happiness to be gleaned from the disaster, we'd like to leave you with a somewhat more uplifting note. Before the explosion, as the Mont Blanc was burning, a railway dispatcher by the name of Patrick Vincent Coleman was at his post at the rail yard a mere 750 feet from the Mont Blanc. He and his co-worker learned from a fleeing sailor of the dangerous cargo on board, and they began to run for safety. However, as he ran, Coleman remembered that there was an inbound passenger train from New Brunswick carrying around 300 people and due to arrive within minutes. Coleman turned around and returned to his post alone, where he sent an urgent message. Hold up the train, ammunition ship afire in the harbor, making for Pier 6, and will explode. Guess this will be my last message. Goodbye, boys. Coleman would be killed by the explosion, but his message got through. Every train bound for Halifax was halted at a safe distance from the blast, including the passenger train at Halifax. It is a fact, then, that Mr. Coleman's actions saved hundreds of lives that day, and he is a hero through and through. So I won't ask whether you enjoyed that video. It was fairly horrific and brutal. It's the largest explosion ever before the nuclear bombs. Uh, but if you did find it interesting, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, please do support this show by supporting our wonderful sponsor, CuriosityStream, who I'm linking to below. Thank you for watching.